A trip to Blockbuster was a cherished moment for many of us. In the early 90s and early 2000s, renting a movie from the video store was the highlight of our weekends. And there's no doubt that Blockbuster Video played a pivotal role in many of us falling in love with cinema. It wasn't just the movie itself that we all looked forward to, it was the whole video store experience. The endless sea of shelves, loaded with colorful cases from floor to ceiling, the be kind rewind signs, the smell of everything, and all the amazing snacks. Today in 2020, only one Blockbuster store remains in the entire world, and the last stronghold in Oregon has become a pilgrimage destination for many film fans that want that Blockbuster experience one last time. But how did a company that meant so much to so many people, once at the top of the film distribution food chain, go from a market giant to a figment of our nostalgia-tainted memory in such a short space of time? Let's take a look at how Netflix killed Blockbuster. Blockbuster was founded in 1985 by entrepreneur David Cook. Cook's previous business venture provided computer software for the oil and gas industry in Texas. But Cook saw the business potential in opening a video rental chain and opened the first Blockbuster in Dallas in 1985. According to David Cook, the opening night of the first store was a massive success. The story goes that they actually had to lock the doors to stop more customers getting in because the store was overcrowding so much. The thing that really set Blockbuster apart from other video rental stores at that time was their huge range of titles. Other independent video stores could only keep track of 100 or so movies at most. But Blockbuster had an innovative new barcode system, which meant that they could track up to 10,000 VHS tapes per store to each registered customer, which also meant that they could keep an eye on those infamous late fees, which generated a massive portion of the company's annual turnover. The next year, Cook expanded the chain by opening three more locations. In 1987, Cook sold part of the business to investors for $18.5 million. The group of investors included Wayne Huizenga, founder of Waste Management Incorporated, the world's largest waste disposal company. Later that year, Cook left and Huizenga assumed control over Blockbuster. Huizenga's experience with founding his own massive company played a vital role in the future of Blockbuster's global dominance. Huizenga saw an opportunity in the stores and video rental system in general. He saw a kind of McDonald's level of potential in Blockbuster, something that could be scaled rapidly and converted into a staple of American pop culture. Under the new leadership of Huizenga, Blockbuster embarked on an aggressive expansion plan, snapping up existing video store chains and opening their own locations in their place. By 1988, only three years after it was founded, Blockbuster was already America's leading video chain, accumulating 400 stores in the US alone. By the early 1990s, Blockbuster opened its thousandth store and was already expanding into the overseas market. In 1994, Blockbuster was bought by media giant Viacom for $8.4 billion. Viacom's other products included 90s icons like MTV and Nickelodeon. Viacom improved on Huizenga's already dominant expansion strategy, and within five years, Blockbuster had opened 6,000 stores globally. But trouble was on the horizon for Blockbuster. In 1999, the Chicago Sun-Times read a newspaper article that stated, Imagine a blockbuster night without blockbuster, a time when no video store will ever slap you with a late fee or fine you for failing to rewind. Because in this world, there are no videos, only home computers. This throwaway comment from a journalist hinted at what was actually in store for Blockbuster Video. The chain was known for charging customers a late fee for every day they were late to return a rental. In fact, Blockbuster made $800 million in late fees in one year alone. This late fee frustrated many customers, including Netflix founder Reed Hastings. Hastings said that aggravation caused by a $40 fine he acquired for returning a late rental at Blockbuster is part of what caused him to conceive Netflix. Hastings' new company developed a more convenient way to rent movies. Just go to Netflix's website, make a list of movies you want to watch, and in about one business day, you'll get three DVDs from that list mailed to you. You keep them for as long as you want without being charged late fees. Then, when you're done, send them back in a prepaid envelope and Netflix will send you three more DVDs from your list. Within a few years, Netflix and Blockbuster's other competitors began to eat into Blockbuster's profits, not by undercutting it, but by innovating and reimagining video rental services for the digital age. In 2000, Blockbuster made the first big mistake that would mark its demise. Blockbuster was offered to buy out Netflix for a mere $50 million, a small amount of money considering Blockbuster was turning over an $800 million profit annually with just its late fees alone. Blockbuster's buyout of Netflix would have seen Reed Hastings leading the development of an online streaming platform similar to what Netflix is today. So who knows, maybe in some alternate reality, Netflix and Chill could have been Blockbuster nut. Ultimately, Blockbuster decided against the purchase, massively undervaluing the potential of Reed Hastings and Netflix. The next year struck another huge blow to Blockbuster's VHS empire. After Blockbuster turned down Netflix's $15 million offer, 
Netflix managed to keep business afloat while Hastings hoped for DVD players to break into the mainstream market, and it finally happened in 2001. DVD players were now far more affordable and a lot more people bought in. VHS was swapped out for the brand new, slim DVD technology. The DVD players were worthless without a collection of DVDs, and Netflix was already there and waiting to fill this void by offering convenient DVD rentals straight to your door. In 2002, Blockbuster's other big competitor, Redbox, launched. Redbox's foray into the market reinforced that people wanted quicker rental options with no late fees, so Blockbuster had to make a change soon. Even so, Blockbuster was still at its peak in 2004. That year, Blockbuster had 9,000 stores globally, 60,000 employees, and earned a $5.9 billion of revenue. But the company started making major changes in the early 2000s that would ultimately lead to its downfall. In 2004, Viacom parted ways with Blockbuster. That same year, the company launched Blockbuster Online, but it was already years behind Netflix. By that same time, Netflix had amassed almost 3 million customers, had no store overhead costs, and was developing its own revolutionary streaming service that we all know and use today. So, Blockbuster scrapped its late fees. It was estimated that this would cost Blockbuster $200 million and another $200 million to start up the company's new venture, Blockbuster Online. Blockbuster realized that the old VHS rental model may have run its course, and the company began its online DVD by mail service, but their new system was still years behind Netflix. In the following years, Blockbuster's market value dwindled, hinting at its bleak future. From 2003 to 2005, Forbes reported that the company lost 75% of its market value. Blockbuster's investors were still persistent that the future of home cinema was in the rental store model, so they ventured to swipe up even more locations. To do so, they sent out an aggressive takeover plan to buy out one of their biggest competitors, Hollywood Video. Billionaire investor Carl Icahn was intent on seeing this deal done and attempted to facilitate the takeover by becoming Blockbuster's largest shareholder, with 9.98 million shares worth about $83.9 million. Blockbuster proposed an offer of about $700 million, later upping their bid to a billion dollars. While Hollywood Video instead agreed to be bought out for less money by the much smaller company Movie Gallery in January of 2005. With so much invested in Blockbuster and a Hollywood Video deal added to the equation, Icahn looked for ways to raise Blockbuster's stock value, causing tension between himself and CEO John Antioco in the process. This internal conflict between Antioco and board members led to him leaving the company, and once again leadership changed hands in 2007, the same year the video empire would receive its biggest blow. In 2007, Netflix hammered the final nail in Blockbuster's coffin as they launched their state-of-the-art streaming service. The only flaw in Netflix's new streaming platform was that they hadn't obtained the distribution rights to best-selling movies or TV shows yet. So the videos available on Netflix's on-demand service were pretty mediocre. Despite that, Blockbuster's profits continued declining and Netflix's profits were still rising. Netflix realized that it needed more popular options on its streaming service for people to get on board. The company made major progress when they signed a deal with Stars Entertainment. This deal granted Netflix exclusive digital distribution rights to bring thousands of movies and TV shows to the platform. In 2009, Netflix posted earnings of $116 million. Meanwhile, Blockbuster, with its continuing financial struggles and legal troubles, lost $518 million and were still in a substantial debt with their previous parent company, Viacom. On July 1st, 2010, Blockbuster was delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. Its push into video on demand streaming came far too late, and over the next three years, Blockbuster died a slow and painful death. DVD by mail services stopped, its partnerships folded, and stores worldwide were rapidly plunged into closure. Blockbuster's 9,000 store global empire was reduced to rubble within a couple of months. While Blockbuster's demise was a painful moment, its steady decline from powerhouse to bankruptcy can teach us an important lesson in business and film distribution. No matter how popular business is, and no matter how much that business means to them, customers will always venture elsewhere to a competitor at the drop of a hat if they're offered better products or services. Long-sightedness and adaptability are crucial for surviving and thriving in any business, and they're two traits that Blockbuster decision makers failed to acknowledge, instead choosing to cling to a dated practice that drove them into the ground while other companies were willing to innovate and move forward. So even though the common misconception is that Netflix led to the downfall of Blockbuster, that's not entirely true. Blockbuster's slow and painful demise was entirely their own doing. No! Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and want to see more content like this, please consider subscribing as well as supporting us over on Patreon. It really helps support and grow this channel and you can get exclusive access to behind the scenes content, early access to videos, and vote on what video we release next. Stay healthy.